Hi, and welcome to our talk on soft failures, hard goals, accelerating payments at scale during the pandemic. My name is Kyle, and I lead the data platform and technology operations team here at Bill.com. Hi, I'm Venus, and uh, I lead the payments and risk engineering team at Bill.com. Okay, we're going to dive into it. First, we're going to cover just the challenges we experienced as soon as the pandemic started. About the March timeframe, when shelter in place started, we saw a very large increase of usage of our platform. People were migrating to online services in order to support their back office business. You can imagine in the past where you could just walk down the hall, go find the CFO or CEO, CEO and say, hey, can I pay this bill or collect this invoice or you know, pay whatever. In the past, that could all be done in person. Now this is all remote. And this has increased the usage of our platform to a place where we had to adjust. Internally to the company, like many of you, we had to switch immediately to 24 seven remote operations. When it comes to payment operations, we have three fundamental teams that are responsible for ensuring this process works seamlessly. The first is our payment operations team that is responsible for coordinating with banks, handling the process, ensuring all payments are handled well. We have our site operations or SRE team responsible for all application operations, performance, any other site issues, as well as our data center operations team that's responsible for production infrastructure or anything else on the systems network or storage side. These three teams had to immediately migrate to 24 seven remote and ensure that all of the collaboration that we used to have in the office where we could just walk down the hall could now all happen remotely. And then third, we saw a significant increase in reliance in third party vendors and cloud vendors, both on their internal IT systems as well as in production. To give folks an idea of why or how the payment processing works at bill.com and why it's so critical. Through our platform, you can either pay or get paid. And as a part of that, you can approve those payments to make sure that they're authorized transactions, or you can invoice your customers. At the end of the day, it flows through our payment engine. And the payment engine is where we're going to focus our talk today on batch processing of these payments. The payment engine is responsible for these five different types of transactions. We could be processing ACH transactions, which is a batch process that happens nightly. We have checks like traditional checks, instant transfers, credit card payments, as well as international payments. Each of these is unique, but at the end of the day, must flow through the platform. Some of the challenges we experienced as a part of this transition was you know, as customers were onboarding, we couldn't slow down innovation. They demanded new features of us as well as our product team wanted to innovate. And we couldn't just say, oh no, we're remote now. We're not gonna do that. We had to be able to scale with the company in order to sustain the growth and fulfill all of the customer's needs and all of the product roadmap. We also saw, unfortunately, an increase of incidents. This include both customer facing and non customer facing incidents that were completely unacceptable um, to us from an operations perspective. We saw as this happened, a shift from tribal knowledge to the requirements for documentation, because in the past where you can just hit someone up down the, you know, down the hallway and say, hey, how do I do this? That was a lot harder now. And so clear procedures and having that documentation and having the necessity to have more of that became really clear to us very quickly. And then finally, we saw just a straining of these third parties I talked about. So our third party vendors, mostly cloud-based vendors, were having issues. You can re remember over the last few months, a lot of big name brands that never went down, went down, including both financial institutions and other reputable third parties. So batch processing. Batch processing is the core to bill.com. We move over $96 billion annually through our platform, and every dollar of that goes through the payment engine. When we looked at the incidents we were experiencing in productions, we found that most of them were actually not code related. 
they were human or process related or human or someone made a mistake. We also discovered that as we were adding new payment technologies to our platform, it greatly increased the complexity of operating that platform, where in the past we only had one or two different payment methods, increased into five different types of methods, actually increased that complexity exponentially. And we needed to absorb that complexity well. And then finally scale, not just on the system side, but also on onboarding new engineers. We needed to be able to get them into our company and onboard it in an efficient manner so that they could be productive and contribute. Before we talk about how we solve for payment resilience, let's spend a few minutes to talk about the culture that allows us to tackle big problems. At Bill.com, we have a culture of extreme ownership. So what is that? I read a great article on conductor.com where Joe Taylor described extreme ownership in two sentences. He said that extreme ownership is the practice of owning everything in your world to an extreme degree. And it means you are responsible for not only those tasks which you have direct control, but for all of the other tasks that could affect whether or not your mission is successful. At Bill.com, we, uh, we encourage uh, the practice of extreme ownership every day, whether it's through uh, product innovation or while we are working through live production situations. <clears throat> and we also expect that our leaders are the ones to set that example. So as a leader, I must own everything. And I must also empower my team to do the same. The challenge is, sometimes this means taking on tasks that are outside our roles. And that can feel uncomfortable. Creating a blame-free culture is a good first step that can help your team get over that mental barrier so that they can take on risks and stretch outside of their normal expectations. And as a leader, it is also my responsibility to do what it takes and to foster the same do what it takes mentality inside my team. And in the book, Extreme Ownership, the authors assert that there are no bad teams, only bad leaders. And I couldn't agree with this more. Extreme ownership is not rocket science. And for the most part, extreme leaders execute the same basic leadership principles. They set goals, uh, sorry, they set targets, they focus the team, they execute. An extreme leader differentiates themselves by having a true belief in the mission and a commitment to its success, no matter what it takes. So this kind of leader removes any kind of obstacles and creates a safe environment for their team to thrive. A safe environment is an environment without blame. And I have a heightened sensitivity on blame because once blame is introduced in your team dynamic, the motivation to problem solve comes to a halt and your mission is now at risk. So we as humans are more inclined to help and are more empowered when we feel safe from blame. So if done correctly, teams with extreme leadership will feel empowered and will take on more responsibility without fear. And I came across this situation during a, a certain project that we had. Our schedule was at risk because our product managers were overloaded. So one of our um, key engineers, uh, Nupur, she brought this up to me during our one-on-one -on -one, and it became clear that she was actually in the position to help. And she acknowledged this herself, but was really hesitant to step in for fear of failure and unnecessary blame because she wasn't a product manager and was afraid to sort of make the wrong decisions. Uh, I eventually convinced her to step up and take on both roles as product and as tech lead. And I assured her that she had my full confidence and support. Basically, you know, I had her back and I even had to say those in those words so that she really believed them and, and understood it. And it was true. So by exercising extreme ownership, uh, even though Nupur and I ended up hitting some bumps along the way because it wasn't perfect, but in the end, the project 
which was our mission, was back on track. And we also improved relationships across teams. And most importantly, Nupur was now empowered and had developed her own ownership mindset. So the more team members we develop like Nupur, the easier the company will shift into an extreme ownership model and the more you will get done. Now let's talk about how we approached building resilience at build.com and how we were able to reduce our customer impact mean time from days to months. So most companies treat resilience as an overhead, like a small tax to run the business. And unfortunately, resilience is commonly one of the first things that drop off when timelines or resources get tight. But given the importance that we place on payments at bill.com, we decided to treat resilience as a project of its own. And so what does a resilience project look like? It looks exactly like any other important business project. You will first need a driver, and this leader should possess a passion for improvement, should be super paranoid, and because resilience success depends on so many cross-functional factors, this leader must also have cross-functional influence and exude extreme ownership. You will also need a, a mission, a clear mission to help define and anchor scope. At Bill.com, the mission for our project was to ensure that we could safely move $96 billion through our payment engine. And like any other project, you will need principles, strategies, and timelines, um, and, and a goal. So resilience is all encompassing. On its own, it can become an ambiguous target. So it's important for us to set specific and hard goals that are ambitious enough to raise the bar beyond what we could have done piecemeal. By doing so, we elevate our quality in a way that instills more ownership towards the mission. So we started with a target of running 40 consecutive days without customer impact as our goal. As we brainstormed dozens of ideas that could improve resilience in the payment space, one of the key principles that guided our decision on what to actually tackle was to time box this project by 90 days. Basically, don't boil the ocean. So we identified six work streams where we could make the most impact. Alerts and metrics, this track focused on emitting timely signals and metrics to inform and to provide the proper level of visibility across the company. Reconciliation was all about tracking every single dollar as it moves through our system. Um, you can think of it as no dollar left behind. Test automation, uh, extremely important because we wanted to catch bugs early and when they were first introduced, usually during the development cycle. Education, uh, payments is a complex domain. And so it's imperative to properly educate your, two, your new team members as we scaled. Anti-fragile design, this is one of my favorite tracks. This track assumed that any, everything would fail. And when they failed, we would need to systematically recover. Ops efficiency, um, another favorite track, was just another way of saying, let's automate the heck out of everything, right? So let's take a look at a few examples of our outcomes. Alerts and metrics. While we like to say we love all our children equally, uh, if you could only focus on one area, then I would say alerts and metrics will give you the biggest bang for the buck. This effort is the first step in elevating your product to become a predictable, reliable, world-class application. Believe it or not, your first hurdle will be to catalog all of the processes and systems in your product and then assess the urgency of each one should they fail. So if your product is anything as complex as Bill.com's payment engine, you will surely know that there's not one person who's going to have the answer to everything. 
So expect to bring cross-functional teams together for this exercise and expect to iterate. Next comes the fun part, creating layers of alarms for different urgency levels and building systematic triggers into the product. Fortunately for us, we already had a framework. And so what we did was expand on it to include more alerts, encompass more events with the ability to alert all the way up to our CEO. One important mind mindset shift for us was not only being alerted when something went wrong, but to have continuous signals for when things went right. So if my boss, who's the VP of engineering, were to ask me, hey, is it safe for me to have a beer now? Can I relax? You know, um, without the positive system status information that, I'm, that, that will be provided to me, I wouldn't be able to provide a definitive answer. And another area of positive alerting is to create dashboards showing metrics that we can use to identify trends and to detect abnormalities. Beyond triggering alerts, we also added documentation and training for how to handle certain situations. My favorite training is our monthly game days where we practice production incidents response. So game days help exercise our problem solving muscle, right? So that if and when incidents occur, we are executing as one single team following one common playbook. It's a cross-functional exercise where we all come together and work through a hypothetical crisis in production so that we have the opportunity to iron out any issues in a low stress environment ahead of time. And obviously one huge benefit is you know, increasing the team's readiness to respond um, during production incident. But it was also surprisingly really fun. And so it provided another opportunity to strengthen the cross team rapport and to develop, a, to develop an appreciation for the contributions of other teams. In the automation work stream, we identified a need to build automated testing into everything that we do. As we've grown, it was clear that manual testing was not good enough to keep up with our momentum. And I was really impressed by how quickly, just within 90 days, that our QA team was able to pivot and build the kind of test automation that covered 75% of our payments platform. And in addition to automation coverage, we also got really serious about unit tests which really should be the first line of defense. We provided org-wide training and put rules in place for every type of code submission. And we also invested in tools like Mokito, GitLab to support developers to write better unit tests. Another one of my favorite work streams is our anti-fragile design effort. A payment engine that moves as much money as we do is like a rocket ship. There's, there's simply no room for error. So rather than assuming a happy path, you have to assume that anything that can fail will. So you really need to be sort of paranoid to succeed in this work stream. And, and once you get through the paranoia, uh, you will be asking yourself, what can you do to protect your rocket ship? So we looked at a few ways and you can look for ways that can allow for graceful failure. So when one record fails, it shouldn't prevent the other records from succeeding. You can find ways to prevent human error, especially during stressful times like live production issues. Um, and to prepare for these scenarios, we created script templates for common database queries so that we weren't scrambling to try to create these from scratch while under pressure. We also took a magnifying glass to the performance of our critical path. In payments, there are processes that happen throughout the entire day that move money to and from our partners. And these processes have a very strict, strict run schedule. We found that some of these processes had performance leeches, leeches like reports or outgoing emails that piggybacked off the main process, dragging down process time. 
So we moved the secondary tasks to non-blocking asynchronous cues in order to streamline our critical path. We also identified bottlenecks. Uh, you would ask yourself the question, which components in our system would be the first to show stress under a high load? So we made great strides to proactively shape our data throughput so that it relieved our main choke points, such as the database. All of these efforts allow for what we call soft failures, meaning when a failure inevitably happens, it's not a crisis for the team or for our customers. Anti-fragile design is an ongoing process and the work here is never done. I'm happy that we were able to make a dent. So I'm really proud of the accomplishments that our team was able to reach in just 90 days. These accomplishments have real world implications. We improved our reputation with our customers. We reduced the amount of time our engineers spent fixing issues instead of you know, time spent that they could be developing future enhancements. And personally, I really appreciated the six months of a good night's sleep without getting paged in the middle of the night. So there are many good reasons to build resilience into your system. And a focused, short-term effort means that you can reap those benefits as soon as you commit to taking on that ownership. In February, 2020 this year, we had our worst month, which inspired us to focus on resilience. By the time we completed our first phase in May, we were well on our way to exceeding our initial goal of 40 incident-free days. So, so this couldn't have come at a better time because if you think back to March, that was the beginning of shelter in place due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the internet was basically melting down, right? We were in a new paradigm. At the same time, Bill.com continued to charge ahead with emerging payments and architecturally, we were rolling out ambitious infrastructure projects that touched all parts of the product platform. And of course, our partners, vendors, customers were all facing the same issues that we were facing. And they really needed our stability more than ever. So our focus enabled Bill.com to not just survive 2020, it allowed us to thrive. And our ability to gracefully handle challenges is a foundation that we can use to anchor for our continued success in future projects. So we recently reached 152 consecutive incident-free days, and I'm looking forward to raising that bar even higher. Okay, thanks, Venus. So in addition to the product and engineering changes that we've made, there were some fundamental shifts in how we thought of our third-party management as well as our business process. The first thing we focused on was our RCA process or root cause analysis. The first was when we had an incident and we were reviewing what happened as a team, we created a standard template. And the reason for that is we wanted to make sure we captured the kinds of information in the way that it was most effective for remediation and ensuring the correct tracking around making sure we knew what was happening. The second was the RCAs had to happen soon. We couldn't wait for weeks and then come back and say, oh, what happened? Do you guys remember? Uh, that was too long. So all RCAs must be completed within three business days. And that ensures that the wound is still fresh and that we're able to remember, but we have enough time to actually do a little bit of forensics to get the next steps in place. Next is we always review the timeline in our RCAs. It's important to make sure that from all sides, we understand what happened and and fully understand the incident. Next is on how we categorize the items. So we, when we went through this process, we quickly identified that there are different kinds of remediation items. The first was process. So we would look at, hey, did someone do the wrong thing? Should we have done this a different way? Should we have processed in it with an SOP? Should we have called this person? And just evaluate how we actually performed. And then the second is on monitoring and alerting, which Venus talked about, is very critical. Did we discover the problem before our customers? 
And then finally, it's code. We look at our code and we say, okay, where could we have built resilience into the platform or have changed the actual exception itself? Next is we do follow the 5Y approach on incidents to make sure we fully understand what happened. So in addition to saying, hey, why did this happen? We get to beyond that to say, well, why did that happen? And, and at the end of the day, get to the actual root cause and all of the leading indicators. This is a complex system, and so it, it, it fails in complex ways. Next, metrics. So SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs have always been a part of Bill.com. We have to adhere to strict standards for our customers and our partners. And so being able to have those contractual SLAs are important. But then we also quickly identified that we need to be tracking more in our incidents and seeing if we're getting better. The first one is the mean time to detect. We need to make sure that after an incident happens, we know about it and we know about it first, and that time is very short. The next is mean time to respond. How quickly did we mobilize the team to actually assess and fix the problem? And then the time between failure. As Venus mentioned, that target, that, that 90 days without an incident, we look at that. And in our executive reviews, we look at how long have we gone without an incident? How long has this component gone without a failure? Next, we focused on sort of the operational readiness. Uh, we quickly identified that our dashboarding tools were all over the place. And it was important that we had a centralized tool and a centralized way to determine how each of the teams is viewing the problem. So when it comes to batch processing, there's usually more than one step in the process. In our case, is we have to generate files, transfer files, and look into all the different downstream systems in relation to that file. And so it was important that these different teams, like our operations, payment ops, and engineering teams, are all looking at the same thing and understand the state of the system and whether or not things are going smoothly. And if there's problems, be able to identify, OK, what finished? Did that finish or did this other thing finish? Um, so that we fully understand what's happening. Next is we reviewed. A, all of our alerts. But it's also looking at not just do we have an alert, but is it clear who owns that alert? And do we have someone who is very clearly calling the ball? Just like in soccer, one person has to have the ball and, and run with it until they pass it to the next person. Next, we focused on the alert catalog. Uh, so in addition to actually having the alerts, we wanted to centralize them but then we also wanted to make sure that we had sufficient documentation so that when the alert would come through, we could say, okay, this alert was responding, needs to be responded to in this way. Similarly, we established SOPs that connect to the alert catalog to allow us to centrally manage and define what they are. And then as a part of our you know, incident process um, or exception process over time, we refine those alerts and get better at our SOPs. Finally, as we focused on process and collaboration, it became really clear when the pandemic started and everyone was sheltered in place that we had to change how we communicate. We found that we had to over communicate in a fully 24 seven world to ensure that everyone was in the loop during an incident. What that means is, for example, if, if there was an incident and something's going on and something doesn't look right and we're not actually getting to the root cause quickly, and it doesn't, and it seems like it's chaotic, we quickly hop on a video with all the key stakeholders to ensure we get resolution. Business continuity is something that we have always been focused on. Um, prior to the pandemic, um, we had never activated it. So this was the first time activating the BCP. And so as a part of this process, it was interesting to reflect on our own BCP process and what we needed to do better. The first was continuing to evaluate our disaster recovery plan from a systems perspective, um, as well as a people perspective, right? If people are, have to move, work in different areas or work remote, or if our systems are unavailable in a certain region, do we have all the procedures in place? Do we practice that? Do we actually fail over our system and ensure that it can run from an alternate processing center and not have uh, too much customer impact or no customer impact? 
Second is we initiated a different kind of game day, similar to what Venus was talking about in processing an incident. What we would do is we perform tabletop exercises at least yearly. What these are is we're looking at a crisis response and understand with the key executives at the company, do we know our own internal procedures for what we would do during a crisis? We established an emergency response team um, to identify all the key stakeholders in the company. Who does what and which executive is responsible for what and what is the call tree for an incident? So we call that our crisis communication plan to ensure that all the notifications internally and externally are well-defined. How do we communicate to customers? How do we communicate to partners? One thing we determined here is it's okay to ask for help in a business continuity plan. There are actually really great companies out there that you can look at to provide best practices. And especially if this is a new process, it can be daunting when you think of an entire business and how you would recover in case of a failure. Finally, the business impact analysis, the BIA. We've always had a BIA, but what was interesting in the pandemic, we realized even more so how important the BIA is. What we are looking at are both the first party and the third party providers. So in the first party, we're looking at, hey, if this system fails, do we have a recovery plan or are we doomed? Secondly, we're looking at third parties. If that provider fails, do we have an alternate provider? If they go down, what do we do? And how much impact does that cause for the company? And is it acceptable? So what that also led to was our vendor management. As we're looking at our BIA and we're saying, okay, these are our vendors. They're important to us. We need it to run our system. However, if a vendor fails, it doesn't matter that it's a vendor. It's still your issue. And as almost every company is aware, we are very reliant on multiple cloud providers as well as service providers, but our customers don't care. If something goes down, it's down. And so it's very important that the vendor management and ownership of that vendor is super clear to everybody. We complete the BIA, we make sure that there's a redundant provider, and then we share that BIA with the executive team. And we say, okay, these are all the vendors that are critical for the business. Here is their current status, and here is our evaluation of them. As a part of that process, we also complete security reviews when they start, as well as on an annual basis. And then we perform a financial review. In the financial review, what we're looking at is, does this provider, how are they gonna do during economic stress times? Especially after the pandemic started, we did this process to ensure that we would know, is this company that we rely on, could they go bankrupt? Do they have sufficient funds to survive the pandemic? Finally, we looked at the, the documentation component of it, which doesn't sound fun, but it's super important. So we made sure that the actual vendors are documented, that the contacts are clear, and that all of that is in place. Okay, finally, we wanted to cover the next steps in what we call our capability model. So first is there's three books uh, that we would recommend. Uh, the first is called The Manager's Path by Camille Fournier. This book is about, especially as a in growing engineering leader from a tech lead all the way up to the CTO, how do you take on additional responsibility? And this absolutely relates to scale. As a company scales and the systems get more complex, being able to lead through that change is essential. Secondly is extreme ownership, which Venus mentioned uh, from a couple Navy SEALs, ex-Navy SEALs. And then finally, an elegant, an elegant puzzle by Will Larson, which is a great book for SRE as far as how do you scale an SRE team as you grow. These have been fundamental in just my own growth as a leader and how to get better on the technical side. The capability model is all about saying, okay, how are we doing? So what we've established is the top 10. And you could have as many numbers as you want. We actually had more than 10, but I distilled it down to just 10. In, these, in this capability model, what you're looking at is answering the question on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate yourself in this area? And then add it up and give yourself a score. And then ask yourself, is this sufficient for my business and my company? First, we look at culture. 
how are we doing as a culture? Do we have an extreme ownership culture? If there's an incident, do people engage or do they run away? Are your deployments fully automated? Are you practicing common uh, continuous deployment or continuous delivery methodology? Do your code check-ins, are, are your code check-ins only permit, permitted if the code coverage is improved? If someone's checking in code and your code coverage is going down, should you allow that check-in? Next, we're looking at automation testing. Does it complete timely and does it cover everything that you need? Timely is important because if there is an incident and you need to get it to production, it's important that that automation completes fast so you have confidence that you're not gonna break it more. Next is around tech debt or sometimes called RTB. Do you have sufficient time and sufficient margin in the schedules for your engineering team to support dealing with that tech debt? A good target is 20%. I think for every company, you get to figure out what that is for you, but it is important to establish a target and for you, does it make sense and are you meeting it? Next is around continuous integration. Are your builds fully automated? Is your code review mandatory? And do the code reviewers know their responsibility? It's more than a style guide. Code review is about mentoring the junior engineers and it's about ensuring that, especially in complex systems, we're not gonna introduce new bugs or anything like that. Next is on branching. Do you have a modern branching structure? Are you using Gitflow? Whatever, whatever branching structure that is a stable-based deployment, follow that and, and give yourself a point. One interesting rating is how quickly you can get your code from dev to prod, the cycle time. Is that matter? Is that measured in minutes, hours, days? For us, we reset it was an hour. From dev to prod, can we get it there safely within an hour? Next is our top three metrics. So for our critical systems and for each of our critical teams, what we do is establish a top three metric. When we were under um, heavy incident load, we were reviewing those top three metrics every single day. And we were asking ourselves, how are we doing on our top three metrics? And then determining whether or not it was acceptable and going in the right direction. The frequency and the actual metrics are completely uh, arbitrary as far as what it is for you, but it's important to establish them. Every team should have them and have a cadence for reviewing them. Finally, we wanted to thank everyone so much for listening to our story about how we scared our platform through the pandemic. We hope that you learned some new tools and improving your own internal systems and process. So thanks and stay safe. Bye-bye.